Hey everyone, thanks for your time. This is a podcast about Artemis, but this video will look at the two big Artemis adjacent launches that occurred on Thursday, January 16th, several hours apart. Both Starship and New Glenn are designed to eventually be reusable launch systems, and both tested orbital operations and recovery. The first launch successfully demonstrated orbital operations, but has work to do on first stage recovery. The second launch was the opposite. The first stage was recovered intact, but the flight failed during ascent and never reached orbit insertion. Starship and New Glenn will eventually play big roles in the current Artemis plans, beginning with the lunar landings set for Artemis 3, 4, and 5, so their progress towards those are relevant here. And it was also otherwise a relatively quiet week. There were a few pictures published, which I'll go over, but beyond that, maybe the focus is on what happens to those current Artemis plans, with power in the U.S. just about to change hands on Monday, January 20th. First, let's start with those two important launches on Thursday. Blue Origin's New Glenn launch vehicle placed a demonstration payload in orbit on its first launch. Liftoff occurred at 7.03 UTC on Thursday, January 16th, with the first stage's seven BE-4 engines burning for over three minutes before main engine cutoff. After separation and a short coast, the second stage's two BE-3U engines started for the first of two burns. The first burn was nine and a half minutes long and placed the upper stage in an elliptical parking orbit, which Jonathan McDowell estimated to have a perigee of 161 kilometers and an apogee of 2400 kilometers. Engine start for the second burn was planned about an hour after liftoff, with a burn duration of about 75 seconds, to raise the apogee up to 19,300 kilometers. Although the first attempt to recover the first stage was unsuccessful, the rocket achieved the primary objective of the launch, which was to reach orbit with its second stage and payload. It not only did that, but continued with the upper stage restart and apogee raise burn to the targeted demonstration orbit. Hopefully with this success, Blue Origin will start to share more about all the work that they are doing and planning. We'll see. Many hours later, but on the same day, the seventh Starship flight test began in the local mid-afternoon of January 16th, with liftoff at 2237 UTC. The test was expected to last over an hour, but the ship failed during ascent and flight test seven ended when it destroyed itself and broke up before completing its orbit insertion burn. Communications were lost eight and a half minutes after liftoff with data indicating that five of the six engines had shut down. The Super Heavy booster on this test returned to the launch site and was the second one fully recovered with a catch above the launch pad, but the failure of the ship occurred before many test objectives could be executed. During the SpaceX coverage, the display of the ship's status indicated a multiple engine out situation prior to loss of signal. Around 7 minutes 40 seconds after liftoff, one of the three inner Raptor engines was indicated out. Another inner engine out was indicated at liftoff plus 8 minutes 3 seconds, then an outer engine one second later. At that point, it's possible that control of the vehicle was already lost. The data from the ship froze at 8 minutes 27 seconds after liftoff. Eyewitnesses downrange posted videos from places like the Turks and Caicos Islands showing the ship post-breakup or pre-breakup showing what looks like activation of the flight termination system. However, that isn't confirmed. SpaceX calls these failures rapid unscheduled disassembly events, but the question in this case is whether the explosion was intentionally commanded by the FTS or whether the ship exploded unintentionally as a part of the failure and vehicle breakup. The video that Scott Manley did on January 16th talks about the explosion occurring almost three minutes after loss of signal, which would suggest an intentional FTS command so we'll see if that's confirmed by SpaceX during this period in between flights. I would imagine many of you have already seen that video, but I'll put a link to it in the description. There were also some social media posts from passengers and pilots of air traffic in that Caribbean region showing the descending post-breakup debris field. As they say in the industry, that's why they test. This was another flight test of ship and booster prototypes 
but this was the first flight test of a major set of upgrades to the ship, which were significant changes. In this iterative development approach, flight testing is fundamental to the process. As we saw with previous flight tests in 2023 and 2024, SpaceX will resolve the problems, fix them on the next prototype, and then get ready to fly that next prototype. We'll have to wait to see what effect this ship ascent failure has on the schedule for the next flight test. The post-flight statement from SpaceX only says that a fire broke out in the aft section of the ship and that fire led to the intentional or unintentional explosion and breakup. But that's only after an initial look at the data. Later investigation would chase down why the fire broke out. Since a mishap occurred, the Federal Aviation Administration is requiring a formal mishap investigation to be completed before SpaceX can launch the next Starship prototype. The FAA is also requiring a formal mishap investigation from Blue Origin for New Glenn due to the failure to recover the first stage on its launch. We'll have to see how long SpaceX's investigation takes to complete and then how long the fixes take to implement. There was some speculation pre-flight that the next flight test, number 8, could be the first attempt for a ship to go into orbit. We'll have to see whether that first orbital attempt was contingent on the results of this test or not. It's more likely to delay some of those iterative development objectives, so the next flight will have to pick up many of the test objectives of this one, but Elon Musk said shortly after the ascent failure that he still wants to fly again next month in February. Since I'm focused on the Starship Lunar Lander variant and its readiness to support Artemis 3, long term it's too soon to know what the impact will be, if any, to the overall HLS schedule. Since we didn't know what the flight test schedule looked like before this test, it's still hard to guess after. The first question, as we've already said, will be how long it is until the next flight test takes place. Whenever SpaceX conducts one of these tests, there's always questions about how the outcome will affect the Artemis 3 schedule. The ultimate question for Artemis is when the HLS variant of Starship is in lunar orbit, ready for Artemis 3. This flight test doesn't really change the Starship watch items for Artemis 3. The next thing we're still waiting to see is when the first orbital flight test occurs. It can take a little time for there to be any clarity, but Artemis 3 was just delayed until mid-2027, so SpaceX has more time to work with for the lunar lander variant they will provide to NASA for the mission. There was a good interview of HLS program manager Lisa Watson Morgan by Stephen Clark with Ars Technica, which was published a few hours before this flight test, and that provided a few clues about intermediate steps. The last date in public for the start of the big Artemis demonstration tests was March, but NASA defers to SpaceX for Starship details since it is the company's program. So there's no updated date for the start of that flight test sequence, and there's still no flight test schedule between here and there. But that story and interview will be something to go over in future videos. On the day after the flight test, there were some reports of ground impacts of debris, and the FAA statement issued said they were still trying to confirm property damage reports on Turks and Caicos. That will be something else to watch heading into next week and beyond. In other news and notes for the week, NASA Kennedy Space Center Public Affairs posted a few pictures related to stacking the Artemis II vehicle, but otherwise it was a quiet week for news about Artemis II. First, pictures of the solid rocket booster forward assemblies being transported on January 14th from the booster fabrication facility at KSC to the transfer aisle of the vehicle assembly building were posted midweek. The forward assemblies will be the last two SRB elements lifted into place. Now that they are in the VAB, they will be prepared for that lift after all 10 motor segments are stacked. The NASA EGS social media post notes something I neglected to point out last time, which is that the forward assemblies not only include most of the booster avionics in the forward skirt, but that the forward set of booster separation motors are housed inside the frustum. Then, on Friday, January 17th, a set of shots of the right-hand center-center segment being lifted into High Bay 3 were posted. The center-center segments are obviously distinctive, given the large NASA Worm logo painted on the cases. As I noted in a podcast almost a year ago, the position of the logo was moved when comparing to the Artemis 1 boosters, 
to the plus Z side of the SRB systems tunnel. Beyond that, through the first two working weeks of the year, there's been no updates on the status of Orion assembly and test, which is the critical path for Artemis II launch readiness. The last update was at the media event about a month ago at Kennedy Space Center. There were a few more shots published of the Orion environmental test article in the Multi-Payload Processing Facility, or MPPF, at KSC. The images were taken on January 7th, showing some backshell panels removed from the crew module. The Artemis I crew module formed the core of that test article. Now that testing of that article at the Neil Armstrong Test Facility in Ohio is complete, it is back in Florida for another round of testing there. President Trump takes over power again on Monday, beginning his second term like Grover Cleveland did in the 19th century. For Artemis, we're watching to see what changes the incoming administration wants to make, from Elon Musk and the Doge Review to NASA Administrator nominee Jared Isaacman. Up until New Year's, most of the murmuring and whispers was coming from the Trump transition team side, but in the last week there were some reports of trial balloons or positioning from a few members of the 119th Congress, which began on January 3rd. So far, there's only been hints about what Artemis programs Doge might target for termination slash cancellation, and this will be a continuing area to watch. Now that Trump's second term is starting, one of the questions that goes along with what Doge might terminate is the question of when. Speaking of hints about the timing of events, Jeff Faust's story in Space News on January 14th included a note from Congressman Glenn Ivey, who projected that Isaacman's confirmation would take place in March, to allow time for the Senate to complete work on cabinet-level nominations. If that's the case, then NASA Associate Administrator Jim Free will be acting NASA Administrator for a few months, likely beginning next week and continuing until Mr. Isaacman is confirmed by the Senate. The terms of current NASA Administrator Bill Nelson and Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy as a part of the Biden administration will end on Monday, January 20th, and NASA published a farewell message from them on Friday the 17th. Thanks as always for watching. Click on the like button if you found this video informative. We'll be looking for updates on nearer term Artemis preparations, such as for Artemis 2, but the next flights for New Glenn and Starship are going to be recurring topics during the next few weeks and months.